recording. So we will have this one. Uh, but as you can see, the, the whole landscape behind the, the Virgin is something that is com a complete creation by, by Leonardo. So if you want, you have that far, it's like somebody going to the moon, coming back and deciding, okay, I'm going to do a moon-like landscape because it pleases him. And that's pretty much what Leonardo is doing. But he's one of the first to introduce behind these extraordinary uh, figures at the forefront to have a landscape instead of having an interior with or a golden background. In Venice, again, with Giorgione, we have that small painting of the Tempest. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Don't pass by because it's a small painting and we have a tendency not to see it. But uh, it's absolutely uh, beautiful. And what makes the whole painting is that very threatening landscape that you have at the back, that sky that is ominous. Uh, but again, we have difficulties locating you know, where it is and what it is. There are things we can recognize because of some of the architecture. They pretty much know what kind of palace uh, is behind there. But what we are fascinating by, fascinated by is the, the, the sky, the, the, these clouds, uh, the lightning, uh, the beautiful trees that are in front, and then that water that runs between the two figures on either side. And so we, we see how people are starting to feel the landscape and uh, use it in an emotional way to give really that atmosphere around the painting. Titian, who of course uh, worked very closely with Giorgio and, and probably finished many of his painting, produced that beautiful painting, The Sacred and uh, Profane Love, uh, that uh, he painted when he was about 25 to celebrate the marriage of Niccolo Aurelio uh, and Laura Bagarotto in 1514. And uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on the two main figures uh, who are absolutely beautiful. But what stands out is that extraordinary landscape in the back. And you can look at the left, you can look at the right. And suddenly, wow, you have not only a few trees and so on, but you have scenery, you have shepherds uh, with their, their a flock and uh, other figures there that um, a, a rider who is uh, galloping towards the, 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 the little town on the upper left. Uh, all these are, again, something new that really gives that beautiful backdrop to a narrative. And you can look at the detail, how he spent quite a bit of time in putting it together and giving it some sense. Even the sky is, is very beautiful with the, these uh, horizontal clouds, the beautiful steeple, and then some water, and then the shepherd and his flock there. So, Landscape is starting to take a lot more importance, but it's still always a backdrop to a narrative. It's mostly in the north that we're going to see early on the first uh, big landscapes where landscape takes everything and the human being becomes just like a little marionette, just there to make sure there is life on the planet. So on the left, you have the, one of the many uh, landscapes made by Dürer. Uh, this was done actually before he went to uh, Italy for the first time and show some of the typical landscape that uh, he was uh, uh, used to. So this is a wire drawing mill in a very typical landscape in around Nuremberg. Uh, that is kind of rolling hills and then some mountains in the background. Uh, he produces a few of these that shows the, the, the wonderful architecture uh, of the time, but also some details of the, the uh, river going through and then the roads and the churches in the background. Rogel, I don't have to introduce you, he comes a little later. 
uh, he's born actually about the time Dürer dies and uh, is going to be fascinated by landscape. This is going to make the majority of the works he's going to produce will be landscape with bigger or smaller figures. This is one of his uh, labor of the months, the series of six paintings that he did uh, on the labor of the months. Uh, this is the one in uh, New York in the Metropolitan, which is the corn harvest. And when we mean corn, you know that it, mean, it means wheat. There was no corn, maize in, in, um, uh, the, on the continent at that time. But you see again, both actually are bird's eye view of the landscape. So it's almost like they are in a hot air balloon when they are painting it and giving us a better idea of that very long horizon. So in, it, in Italy, what we see is what we can almost call pure landscape uh, is, comes with uh, Annibale Caracci, one of the three Caracci uh, family members. He is the brother of Agostino and the cousin of Ludovico, all born in Bologna. Uh, the three of them found the, the academy with, uh, together uh, in around 1582. And that academy is going to structure a little bit the learning process uh, for uh, painters. And uh, not only just the technical aspect, but also the um, intellectual aspect of painting, uh, making them familiar with uh, works of the ancient work of contemporaries that were interested in art or the, what uh, the, their idea was about subject matters and how ideally it should be done. Works by Alberti would typically be on the curriculum. Uh, that academy in Bologna was one of the first one in Europe and became a very important school that then produced a whole generation of important artists uh, in the beginning of the 17th century. Uh, he traveled to Parma and Venice, where, of course, he was in touch uh, with the, the great painters in these two cities, and particularly in Venice, with many Flemish painters that had settled in Venice and that were teaching uh, engraving and other uh, skills. They were called, uh, his brother Agostino and him were called to Rome in 1595 to start decorating the Camerina, which is the beautiful gallery in the Palazzo Farnese, where they did the, the whole ceiling uh, with uh, the, the stories of gods uh, in, the, in the, what is really interesting in the palace of the Cardinal. It was unusual to have mythology. At that time, the Cardinal happened to have a marvelous collection of uh, classical sculpture that were displayed in that very gallery. And so they decorated the whole ceiling with the stories of Hercules and other uh, very important figure of the Greek mythology. He actually, uh, unfortunately, his health took a bad turn and he died prematurely in 1609 and was buried in the Pantheon next to Raphael. I'm going to show you a few. It didn't produce too many landscape paintings, but they were very important because they were always shown as examples. Only 21 uh, landscape paintings were uh, cited in the uh, Catalogue Raisonné by Posner when he wrote it. Caracci was a very interesting painter because he was very eclectic. Not only did he do history paintings, mythological or others, portraits, uh, but he painted landscapes, genre scenes, uh, and uh, also some self-portraits, and he was known for caricatures. He uh, would doodle a lot, apparently, and he, we still have pages of caricatures that he had produced. So when you see that uh, rectangular shape, which is an extreme rectangle, 
you know that this was not to be displayed just on the wall, but it would be put on top of a door or of, on top of a window. These two paintings are a pair. And you can see one is um, related to fishing and the other one to hunting. And built pretty much in the same way. If you look at the way he balances his figures within the landscape, um, it's uh, pretty much down that way. As we can see on both of them, there is uh, importance of um, water. The atmosphere itself is very heavy with moisture. It's definitely inspired by Venice surroundings and by Giorgione. And this is the big difference. If you go from, for example, Florence to Venice, you're going to feel how the, the Venetian painting is so much more atmospheric than whatever you find in um, Florence because it's a drier climate there. And in Venice, you have the constant moisture that really makes a difference. Even in the color, it impacts the color scheme. So it, it's interesting how it describes uh, all the figures and the different stages of, of um, the, the fishing process. So you have here uh, the, the fishermen, they, they are stretching the nets at the, in the background. Here they are in the barge and they have the product and they're going to, even still in the water, going to hand over the, the fish to people who want to buy it. And on the other side, you have uh, people coming back from the hunt. And then in the background, you also have some uh, riders that are performing that, that big hunt. The kind of painting that you see there was very influential on what's going to be the development of landscape. Uh, the very lush uh, surrounding, the, the pretty description of trees. And you might be surprised to see trees like that, that's, seem to have faded. Indeed, the pigment that you see there has faded, depending on the kind of pigment they were using. A green is a very difficult color to, to use in painting because it's made of yellow and blue. And depending on the pigment that you use for yellow, it might be very fugitive, which means it can disappear with time. And then you're going to have blue as a majority but sometimes it's the opposite, depending again on the pigment you use. So definitely more uh, disappearance of the um, pigment there than we have on the other side that is a much darker green because it's the forest. This is the painting you saw at the very beginning, the fly into Egypt. Uh, very, again, it's that kind of shape shows that it was on top of a window or a, uh, on top of a, of a door. In this case, the um, Pietro Aldo Brandini, who was the patron who commissioned the painting, had commissioned four of them for his chapel, for his private chapel. Uh, but uh, at that time, it's the, the period where uh, Annibale became sick and so he had to pass on three of the four uh, commissions to some of his students, uh, very famous students, and uh, who finished the other three. But it's a beautiful example of balance, of really the mastery that uh, Annibale had in, in configuring his thinking. Uh, central uh, architecture there, this is not the representation of a real small town, but it's typical. It's, it's what you would find everywhere. So not difficult to replicate in the sense. You have trees that are framing the painting on both sides. And we're going to see that as very soon with Lorrain, Claude Lorrain, it's, it's a device. It becomes that trick that, that really makes the landscape really uh, very pretty and very becoming. And then you have at the front, you have Mary and Joseph uh, thing to uh, Egypt, and look at the back, you have some dromedaries that are climbing the hill to go to the city. So there is a whole narrative. You can look at all these details 
and uh, they're quite interesting. And despite the fact they would be displayed high up, you can be sure that it was a way for the cardinal to meditate when he was in prayer in the um, in the chapel. He would look at this painting, and it would take his mind and, and uh, bring him uh, some really hard ideas. But it's very, it's I think very soothing when you look at it. Another of uh, the painter that was influenced by him is Paul Brill, who is also a Spanish painter. And uh, um, he came down to, to Italy and stayed there quite a while, became a very big influence when he went back to the North uh, on the Flemish painters uh, for not only the architecture he found in the South. I just brought it in because it's really interesting. This is the Forum Romano in, in Rome. That was called at that time the Campo Vicino, Vicino because people would bring their cows to pasture because it was in such disarray and really in terrible shape. Uh, but you can see that there are all kinds of things happening in there. Uh, all around these, these majestic ruins. So, uh, and here is, by the way, the way it would have looked originally. <laughs> so before we move to Nicolas Poussin, I think we can take a cup of coffee or just uh, take a break of five minutes. Uh, people on Zoom, you can uh, come out and ask questions if you feel. And here you can put the light on, take a biscuit. There's coffee at the back. People, so I don't know if you have any comments or. Um, questions on what we just saw. The other one, if you can. Not, not that one. Yeah, turn off. Yeah, that's it. It's too bright. Any question on this? Hi, Alona. Hi. Nice to see you too. Yes, Francis. Uh, the painting before of Egypt, was that the Nebuchadnezzar painting? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So was this a landscape from his imagination? Oh, yes. But it's not realistic at all. Not at all. No, yeah. but most of them are not. Countryside. Most of them you see the nativities or things like that. They very rarely represent anything that comes remotely uh, from the from Palestine. So it's the kind of uh, not only often you see the Virgin and, and Joseph with what they think was the costume of the time, but everybody around them are going to be in contemporary costume. From Italy or from the north, so that's that's uh, very typical. But the landscape they have, unless they had, they knew somebody who had traveled to Palestine, then you will see a little palm tree or something like yeah. that. That's going to. Yeah, the vegetation. Nothing. Nothing is is, is around that. No. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Yes, and the from um, he's, I think he's from the around Antwerp. I don't have his. Uh, we'll talk about him next year when we talk about the northern. <laughs> but I couldn't tell you from top of my head. But he's he's definitely he was a, a contemporary with uh, Jan Brogo and and so on. So there were a whole cluster of painters in in around Antwerp. And that's where. Well, and yes. would you repeat the questions from your audience? Because yes. we want to hear what they say. Uh, the first question was uh, uh, referring to the flight into Egypt. Uh, was, was that a landscape realistic for the location? And said, of course not. Uh, the second question was, uh, was Paul, where was Paul Brill from? Huh. And from the top of my head, I know he's from the around Antwerp, but I don't know exactly. Uh, where he would be from. So, yeah, you need to. 
And you have to push on the middle button, not the, the small nor the large. The one in the, isn't that middle? Because if you take the large one, it's going to go overflow. It's going to overflow. We're dealing with the coffee machine. Okay. <laughs> Oh, where am I doing that? It's, that's what I was So, but it's really interesting because we have to keep in mind that landscapes was at the bottom of the hierarchy of genres. It was considered, it, these were the painters that couldn't do any better. You know, and it's really interesting because that has slowly become one of the most important genres in painting. Was it commercially viable? I mean, artists. Yes, but they were in. A, but they were kind. Of, we'll see that with Poussin and Lohan, it's going to become a very popular, uh, and really take give them another status, but in the eyes of any academy or of, of uh, other painters, the history painters would be the one that were the most valuable and, and uh, expensive. Were, they were the most expensive, definitely, but they, they were, that was giving you the status, if you want. Mm -hmm. Whereas the landscape, okay, you know, who can't paint a little tree? Uh, the question once it's pushed to the the excellence of Poussin and Lohan, it's going to be something different. And it becomes very decorative. It becomes almost eternal. You can look at the landscape of them then. You're not going to be bored. It's going to be always be beautiful. And uh, so suddenly, the genre, that genre of painting, the, the landscape, is going to become against all odds a, a more important um, style of painting. I am reading a biography of Keats. Yes. Which is like yeah. Uh, well, what's interesting is that relationship between poetry and uh, our nature and, and how influence those romantic poetry. Absolutely, but I'm giving my nature. yeah my and Thursday class is on romantic painting and uh, we just gone through last month through uh, romanticism in England and so the the whole Wordsworth and and the keys and so on and I it. <laughs> you must have <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're talking about the relationship between poetry and landscapes and so on and definitely constable was quite influenced by that mm -hmm. yeah but that's my Thursday topic. <laughs> this is the preparation to the Thursday. Uh, no, um, I did, when was it? Uh, end of September. But I can give you access to my talk. They all on YouTube. And so if, uh, uh, send me an email and I will give you the ac access to the, to that talk, that series, actually. Okay. So, but send me an email to make sure I do. Okay, we, we can turn off the, the light and I'm going to mute you again. You didn't speak much there on Zoom. Let me make sure. Okay. Okay, so the two big names uh, in the 17th century in Italy are two Frenchmen. And they are the biggest um, landscapists as they were in 17th century. Again, not the, the pure landscape, it's still a backdrop for narrative, but it takes so much more importance. And it becomes a way of meditating, but, but also a, that extraordinary backdrop for smaller narrative. The first one is Nicolas Poussin, 
who was born in the Seine region uh, in France in 1594. He went to uh, Italy twice, once in 1624, that is his first Roman period, where he will discover the ancient Roman civilization. Uh, he's going to get very interested in classical mythology. Uh, he will meet Torquato Tasso, who was a great poet uh, in, uh, in um, Italy, and uh, he's going to be quite influenced by him. Uh, but he gives, as we will see, he's, he's a very deep man, and his uh, paintings always have a, a quite a big moral uh, meaning, if you want. So uh, for him, all these paintings we'll see other than just uh, landscapes, but uh, have a deep moral significance. Uh, but he is becoming, and he will become the perfect example of classical clarity and monumentality too. Uh, within uh, a few, like just even one century, there will be that big debate uh, between the Poussinists that are looking at Poussin and his linear style, where the line is more important than the color, and the Rubenists who think that the color is more important and should define the painting more than the line. And the Rubenists are going to win the, the battle. But it was an incredibly big intellectual uh, fight between academics and painters who was on the Poussin side and who was on the Rubin side. He will be called back between 1640 and 42 by Louis XIV uh, to do some work in Versailles and then goes back in 1642 for his second Roman period. He is going to have moments of crisis, the difficult moral choice on what he's accepting his commission, if he thinks it's worth it. Uh, he is not looking at vice and pleasure of the senses, but virtue and the dictates of reason. And he will die in 1665 five, uh, in Rome. He is going to deal with big names, but mostly with rich merchants that really, like, really enjoy uh, the intellectual side of his paintings. And we're going to see the contrast with Laurent, who is, uh, has the Pope and all the aristocracy follows him, but doesn't have at all the same depths uh, as far as the, the message, if you want. So here's a work, uh, an early work by him, of L'Inspiration du Poète, the inspiration of the poet. And, shows actually why uh, he is credited to be the father of neoclassicism in style. He is very, very classical in the way he shows his uh, figures, but also the, the, the kind of uh, color scheme that he uses. Uh, there's not really the very bright colors. They all Typical of what Louis Jacques Louis David is going to use in 1800 or before, it's very, very similar, and we we can imagine that Jacques Louis David was looking at Poussin in many ways. So here you have, of course, the poet who's sitting there, surrounded by muses, and sorry, he's here and uh, uh, being inspired by Apollo, who's holding the Lara and then uh, some nymph. And then you have the little Puto flying above with the, the laurel wreath. This is probably one of his most known uh, work, uh, named Et in Arcadio, Arcadia Ego. This is a phrase that was coined by Virgil and used in the 17th century Italy, uh, 17th century Italy, expressing uh, the humanistic sentiment that even in Arcadia, and Arcadia means death, uh, death uh, is to be found. So even in this beautiful, uh, inspiring landscape, death is omnipresent. And uh, what you see here 
uh, Arcadia was supposed to be a very rustic, secluded area. And his inhabitants, inhabitants were proverbially uh, primitive herdsmen, uh, leading very simple pastoral, uh, unsophisticated lives and happy though. Uh, so often when you talk about Arcadia, it's that idea of imaginary idyllic paradise. But in this case, what we find is we have people that are looking at what is a sarcophagus in the middle of Arcadia. So death, obviously somebody is buried in there. Uh, you have two figures with uh, laurel wreath. Make sure. So the laurel wreath is uh, art and reason and ivory wreath is regeneration. And then the interesting figure here that could interest us is that figure who is looking at his own shadow reflected on the sarcophagus. And this is the origin of, origin of art. The art started by delineating your own shadow. And that's uh, what we see uh, in the uh, big theory of antiquity. So uh, what we have is here a personal declaration of faith uh, that is the driving impulse behind artistic creation according to Poussin. Image, ID and message envelop the fragmentary and perishable in intimations of immortality. So we see right away here the depths and this is really one extraordinary painting by Poussin. Most of the, the landscape painting that he will do are of this type. Again, the landscape is going to be a creation by Poussin. It's not Poussin observing nature and, and reproducing what he sees. This shows, of course, in the forefront, the landscape with St. Matthew and the angel. And also the message that we see is that the antiquity is toppled by Christianity. Matthew is there in the center and we have toppled columns on the side that shows that Christianity was stronger than, uh, than the antiquity and the classic uh, writers and thinkers. And then in the background, we have that very beautiful landscape with big clouds that are not constable clouds. They are just clouds coming from his imagination. And this is what, again, we, we call a vedute. So this is part, it comes from his imagination. It's an ima imagined landscape, not a paesi. Paesi would have been a reproduction of nature. Other painting, the landscape with Orpheus and Eurydice, where we see here Eurydice there, in uh, Orpheus um, before he turns around and uh, is sent back to, to hell. Very typical, we, we have actually there, we have the, the castle who's caught fire. So this must be the uh, follow-up of, of a big fight, but typical Italian thing, Italianizing uh, landscape uh, with the typical architecture of the time that doesn't reflect a particular town. They're not too concerned about the fight. Pardon? I said they're not too concerned about the fight. No, they're absolutely not. They're completely oblivious to it. And then here, landscape with the funeral of uh, Fossion, and I forgot to look into. The, he was a hero, and you can see him carried him by two, uh, probably two slaves to be uh, buried. And then in the background there, you have a whole city, classical city. Uh, and as you can see, trees that are just very abstracted in the way they are painted. 
he made a lot of other kind of paintings too, and I hope to be able to develop him when I talk about Versailles, uh, because uh, he did spend time in France and did some uh, series that are quite remarkable. One of his uh, also very known uh, painting uh, is the Saint Famille à l'escalier, so the Holy Family uh, with the staircase. Uh, but that shows again that very, very classical style of Poussin with figures that are uh, totally idealized that don't, are definitely not painted after a model. Uh, and then the, the drastic um, perspective that we have in the back that goes and shows the, the sky. It, it's quite interesting and look, he, he has seen the paintings by Caravaggio. The basket on the edge of the state is absolutely uh, inspired by works of Caravaggio. Uh, the, what is interesting is that painting was believed to be a copy. Uh, the original being so-called in the, gal the uh, art gallery of Washington. But after cleaning it, they realized that actually this one was the original. And at that time, uh, belonged to um, the Cleveland Museum of Art. Because it was thought that it was a copy originally, it was allowed to be France. And once they realized that it was the original, they came to an agreement and the painting spent sometimes in Cleveland, sometimes in, in Paris, and it goes back and forth. But it's also quite a stunning painting. Who is the dark figure, the man? Joseph? Probably, probably Joseph, yes, absolutely. Turning his back and kind of forgot, yes. So the other great uh, figure, at the same time, a little younger than Poussin is Claude Lorrain, who his name, and I'm sorry to have forgot to put it on, but he's born Claude Gelet, that was his original name, but very quickly was called Lorrain, so from the Lorraine region, uh, where he was born in 1600. He left to Rome in 1613, so very young, with uh, one of his teachers, and then uh, came back 10 years later, uh, was apprenticed to Claude de Rue for one year, Claude de Rue being a, quite a nice painter of his own, and then returned to Rome in 1624, studied with Waltz, who was a German painter, but was influenced by Tassi, Agostino Tassi, who is the famous guy who rates Artemisia Gentileschi and uh, by Karachi and others. Uh, in 1635, it put together what is called the Liber Veritatis. Uh, Liber Veritatis is a, um, a book that he literally bound together of all his drawings. And he was working a lot outdoor. He wasn't working so much in, um, in the studio but did a lot, even did some uh, oils outdoor. He loved to observe nature. He observed the sun, sunrise, sunset, the change, the impact it had on nature around it. So he's a very different, it's a completely different setting uh, mindset as uh, Poussin, who was much more of a studio person. Uh, and so that Liber Veritatis is actually, it was a five volume of drawing where most of his paintings can be found in as drawings within uh, the Liber Veritatis. Uh, it's in print now. I have one of the copies of uh, it's a two, I have the two volumes. And he died in Rome in 1682. Uh, he was originally buried in, one of the important churches, but then his uh, remains were transferred to San Luigi dei Francesi, which was the church dedicated to the French people in, uh, in Rome. 
His early biographers were uh, Joachim von Sandhart uh, with the Deutsche Academy and then uh, Filippo Baldinucci uh, in his uh, big work on uh, the series of painters. So he was mentioned uh, in there. He had a very large output, uh, 300 painting of which 274 survived, which is an incredible rate of conservation. Uh, 1,200 drawings and 50 etchings. Now, one thing that is quite interesting with Claude Lohan, he became so famous in particularly in England that everybody had to have a painting by Claude Lohan in England that they would set next to the window, which would open onto their estate. And sometimes they would modify the estate to look like the painting. So it was, uh, Lohan was a real fad in England at uh, that time. And if they couldn't have a Lohan, they would have a painting by somebody that painted like Lohan. So you find a lot of his works in, in England. As I mentioned, he was um, influenced by Wals, Gottfried Wals, who was a Wals, who was a, a German painter. And you, you can see that he spent some time in Italy. And so you can see here that uh, Tondo on copper uh, by, by Walls that shows that interest in nature, as you can see, a sky that is alive. This is not just uh, a representation. And then uh, a pretty uh, little mill or little, uh, I mean, I don't know what the tower is about, but then, and then the cliff on the side. Uh, Gottfried Wals was uh, influenced, what influenced Agostino Tassi, who, as I mentioned again on sideline, was the guy who raped uh, Artemisia Gentileschi. Uh, and uh, Agostino Tassi uh, worked a lot on landscape and was sent because he was a troublemaker, not only with the what he did to, uh, to Artemisia, but for other things. And he was sent to Livorno as a punishment. And so there he observed people that were uh, the coral fishers. And this is what you see here at the front are people that were fishing the coral from the, the deep sea. So as you can see already there, you have that tendency of these trees that are framing the painting, which is going to become a real staple of the works by uh, Claude Lohan. Uh, most of his paintings have uh, trees that are framing the, the painting. And again, just as we saw with the works of Poussin, uh, we always have figures there. So they're little figures and it can be, in this case, just nondescript, the Roman Campana. There is not a mythological subject in there, but many will, will show that. Uh, but here you just have a shepherd who is uh, playing his uh, little pipe. And then a beautiful landscape with the, the river that winds down to the horizon, the trees. And this is much more based on real landscapes than what we saw with Poussin. Typically, he would take his, his uh, notebook or whatever, go and uh, either just draw or uh, also later do some uh, oil sketches of where, where he went. And studying, you can see how atmospheric his painting is. You have the kind of atmosphere that you're in the air. The sunrise, again, I mentioned to you, he's looking at this change of colors. And I'm, I'm, every time when I walk in the morning, I think of Claude Lorraine, so I'm looking at, see, today it's red, and the, the other day it's gonna be golden. You know? <laughs> and he did the same. He just went around the Roman you know, countryside uh, very early in the morning and, and look at this. And so if you forget the figures that are at the front, you see that that beautiful landscape in the back is quite attractive. He also had a problem uh, with his uh, pigments. 
because he was using a yellow that was fugitive, so that would disappear. And so some of the colors that you see are not the what would have been the original uh, color when he painted it. The landscape with that same figure is the mill. So you have just, you know, people enjoying life. Uh, you have the mill on the side there, little barges, uh, people napping, or they're being busy, but that very lush, beautiful nature and beautiful light that you find in around the, the Rome uh, region. And very much what we would qualify as an Arcadian landscape. And here is a detail, so you can see how he was a slow worker. Uh, very meticulous in the way he was painting and he never lost it. If anything, contrary to many painters like Titian who becomes with age gets a, a loser brush, uh, Lohan is gonna get the opposite. He's gonna get more and more meticulous with age. But look at how beautiful the reflection there in the water and, and then the, the water wheel. It's, Absolutely charming, and his paintings are rather large. And then here is the Liber Veritatis. So this is the, the drawing he did on which he based himself to do the painting. So you can see it's very detailed. Yes. Uh, they they typically about uh, four feet in width. That's pretty much. Sometimes they're bigger, uh, but that's that's pretty much what he he uses. It's really uh, below seventy five inches, uh, often bigger. And we'll see some of other of his paintings that are very very large. He did a series of, oh, see, this is another one, uh, The Rape of Europa. So that's a mythological subject. Uh, but we see here Europa on the white wall, who is Jupiter, of course, and who is taken uh, by him among the nymphs, but with a, a landscape that is absolutely contemporary. So you have ships. These are not Roman gallows, <laughs> gallows, so. But very, again, very meticulous. The figures, he wasn't too good. We're not sure who was painting the figures. Uh, it could be that uh, Tassi was one of them, but it looks like with the evolution of the figures towards the end of his life, the figures become a little looser and less detailed. So they're not sure who, who was, but uh, most probably not his, except when they're far away. He did some extraordinary uh, large paintings uh, that represented port scenes. And again, you have to look at the fact he's using the sun exactly the way it would be, the light of the, the sun. This is the port scene with the embarkation of St. Ursula. So Ursula, I think, is up here, ready to, to, go, to go down. And that, ar that architecture on the left is so beautifully painted. You have that uh, work. Again, this is creation in his own mind. He's not reproducing something he's seeing. But then what is interesting is the, all the ships he's showing because he uses some contemporary and some older models. But these are, for example, very large paintings. So probably I would say 90 inches in width uh, of more or more. This is another one showing the uh, seaport with embarkation, embarkation of the Queen of Sheba. And again, you have that classical architecture framing. This time it's not the trees, but the architecture that frames the, the scene. 
and then very up. Oh, sorry. So sorry. I got too enthusiastic with mine. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so uh, same same process. So you have the Queen of Sheba that's processioning there down there on the right, and then they are putting together all her um, chest to bring into the the ship. But it's an excuse to show one of these extraordinary decor. And the light, as you can see with him, the light is paramount. And then here, one of a later work, it's Enea's Farewell to Dido in Carthage. That's, and you can see that the, the atmosphere has changed. It gives a bigger importance to the figures and the landscape is uh, kind of secondary. But it produces, as I say, uh, quite a large amount of, of landscape that is close to being the pure uh, landscape. So uh, this is quite interesting because I'm at the cross section between the beginning of the landscape here and the explosion of landscape in the Romantic period, which is my Thursday class. Um, but I hope this gave you a feeling for it. Uh, the next class will be about the followers of Caravaggio, that's in two weeks. And then for those that want for the Thursday period, uh, it's uh, next week and it's going to be, actually we finished with the landscape, we're going into the end of the neoclassicism of the neoclassicism uh, in France. Let me finish the, stop the recording.